this is actually a quite surprising thing because we are used to translate menorah into English as lamp stand, as an illuminating device. And, but actually menorah is derived from the root, which has parallels in Aramaic and Akkadian, which might be used also in relation to fire and not only to lighting. So we might need to rethink our translation of this word. Hanan El Shapira, welcome to the podcast. Before we get started, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. I'm a PhD student at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel, and I've just recently submitted my dissertation on last Friday, and I work on priestly literature mainly, and this is my focus in my research, and I have been accepted for a postdoc position in the uh, University of Zurich, uh, which I hope I will begin in the spring semester. Being someone who works with priestly sources, how did, how did we do discussing that in the second episode? It was interesting. It was very general. <laughs> so I couldn't really, I work less with a narrative and more with the legislation. And it's, of course, there, there is an intricate relationship between the two, but yeah, my opinion about the chapter one in Genesis is I have less strong opinion about it. <laughs> Fair enough. I was just wondering if maybe you had any feedback, but we'll get into why you're here and you're here to discuss your article, making sense of the incense altar location in the sacred space and text. So that's from the journal of biblical literature. My understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is your thesis is that you're accepting Wellhausen's conclusion that the prescriptive incense altar is a later addition to the text of Exodus 25 through 29, but that does not mean that it was absent from the temple rites. Is that what you're saying in your article? Yeah, it, it, yeah that, that incense was not absent in the... And I might say that the question of actual reality behind the text is less my focus and more the what the text says about how the cult should be performed uh, so the question is whether although in in my ma thesis on which this uh, article is based then i did uh, deal also with uh, the the actual uh, reality because it was in archaeology and bible so there was an archaeological section which i in which i indeed claim claimed that this this my main idea is that incense was indeed practiced or at least uh, prescribed although not on the incense altar uh, which is the later edition as Wellhausen said yeah and that in instead the menorah played a part in the burning of yeah. incense is that correct yeah the so the problem of the where it is prescribed about the incense altar is like centuries old already a medieval jewish interpreter exit with this question and wellhausen actually came and took this question and said this is evidence for stratification we are dealing with a base layer which is which did not include the incense altar and on, only later this incense altar was introduced into the cult into the daily cult at the tabernacle and i claim that this big problem of where it is prescribed after the tabernacle is already ready for for its uh, initiation ceremony and also other problems within this paragraph which are like the headline and it's which already at the outset tells you what it is meant for and also the manner in which the function is described which is uh, different from other descriptions of function of other vessels in the tabernacle they all implied this paragraph is indeed later insertion and not part of the original priestly prescription of the tabernacle and parallel to this there is also a problem 
with a function of the menorah. It is not in its place. All the other functions are described at the end. The very last sentence in each vessel describes the function of the vessel. The, the ark is the place where the edut should be placed. The cover should be placed on the ark. And the table is used for the bread. All of these appear at the end of the, of the paragraph. And only here in the menorah, there is, it cuts. It is like there are all additional phrases afterward uh, appear describing the utensils of the menorah. And, and also all the other functions use the Hebrew verb natan, which is to put or to give or something like this. And there is no natan verb in the description of the function of the menorah. And there are also like two or three more adi three additional problems that testify for, uh, attest that this, this very tiny function sentence is actually also a later addition. So I tried to combine the two problems, the problem of the lateness of the instance altar and the lateness of the function of the menorah and claim that actually the menorah was originally used for instance, which is any time it is described in the, in in the Pentateuch, the use of incense, it uses the, this verb natan, to put the fire on the vessel used. So, yeah, this is my thesis, that the menorah was, in, in, that the, the incense cult was initially performed on the menorah. Uh, and this is actually a quite surprising thing, because we are used to translate menorah into English as lampstand, uh, as an illuminating device. And, but actually, menorah is derived from the root nur, which has parallels in Aramaic and Akkadian, uh, which might be used also in relation to fire and not only to lighting. So in fire, in gen generally in fire with fire and even kindling fire, and also uh, in Akkadian, one of the meanings is like to uh, to light to to light incense. So uh, so yeah, it actually fits. <laughs> so we might need to rethink our translation of this word. Yeah. What function did incense serve? in temporal rituals? Wow, <laughs> that's a huge question. I did not specifically deal with it in this article, but uh, generally speaking, I would say that it has a functional function. You give, uh, you offer bread or meat to the deity and it smells when you put it in fire and it attracts insects. And also we today know that it might also cause this diseases and so on. And the incense actually uh, attacks all those problems and they knew it. So they put it together and there are all actually many texts in the ancient Near East deal with this, with the use of incense as as part of offering food for someone. There is an Egyptian uh, text. I, wow, I now forgot its name, but it likes the king is asking his courtiers to tell him uh, I'm using stories and each of them tells of a magic that some of his ancestors has made. And then he says, so let's offer, and when they finish the story, each story, then he says, then let's offer this deceased man so and so amount of bread and so amount of incense. Yeah. So, so it comes together when you give bread and so you give incense with it. So it won't be uh, attracting insects and everything will be fine.
informed smell. <laughs> yeah, and you do mention that in the article that even people in their homes would use incense to keep insects yeah. and things away. But, yeah, this so, also has, so it is attested in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible itself. Yeah. So it's functional, like on on this side of the worship, on the terrestrial side of the worship. But of course, like any other, um, I don't know if any other, but like many other um, actions, uh, when they uh, arrive at the uh, religious sphere and they function there, then they also attach some uh, more religious meaning or something like this. So even in this Egyptian text that I mentioned, which I will need to come back to you about its name, it is called Sen Nature, which is belongs to the gods, uh, to the deities. Nature is God in ancient Egyptians. It is it became to be uh, perceived as a manner of communication with the deities because there is a smoke that goes up to the sky, and we know that the deities like good smell, good, good scent. And so, when I light uh, the incense, I actually attract the deity and I communicate with him. So it became to be something more than only to deal with the, the smell and the insects. Um. So it's practical and it has some theological significance yeah too yeah that's fair one of the things i was wondering as i was reading it you mentioned a variance between septuagint texts and how they talk they discuss that can can you go into that the the difference i don't need to talk a bunch about it because i have you here (laughs) yeah so uh, the septuagint in general is a very interesting area of investigation in biblical studies because many times there there is a different version in it although sometimes this different version is actually dependent on translation issues there are many translations i know translated to modern hebrew which deviate from the origin from the original in some manner because the audience has different tastes and uh, they they have different uh, nuances and different ideas about they might not understand all the references and so on so there is a big question of how the very varying uh, version in the Septuagint actually uh, relates to the Hebrew, which is called Forlage, uh, the underlying text that it uh, it is presumed to represent. The interesting thing is that in the Pentateuch, the Septuagint is actually very close to the Hebrew that we have. But in Exodus, at the end of Exodus, there is a major deviation from our text, from our Hebrew text, the Masoretic text. And one of those deviations, it is much shorter. The, those chapters, 35 to 40, depict the actual construction of the tabernacle. There is the, the command. The commands are given in chapters 20, 25 to 29, and then to 31. And the actual construction is in 35 to 40. And then the Septuagint tells a totally different thing. It does not follow the command, the command, the commandment. Uh, in the Masoretic text, you can find a very literary repetition every time that it, this is a, an imperative in the in the prescriptive account. Then you find it as a indicative in the descri- uh, descriptive account. You should do, you shall do some so and so. And then he did so and so in the descriptive account. And it's totally, it it changes a lot in the uh, Septuagint. 
So there is a big question of what the hell is going on here uh, and why does it differ so much and why does it, doesn't it follow the, the style of the, the prescriptive account? And uh, there are some details that actually are totally absent. And one of them is the instance altar. It is actually in a very consistent manner, does not appear in those chapters in the Septuagint. I want to correct myself. It's 35 to 39. Chapter 40 is a totally different story, uh, different phenomenon. One claim that has been raised by already by Julius Popper, in, which is a contemporary to Julius Wellhausen, uh, a Hebrew rabbi in Germany, who claimed that it is actually it actually preserves an earlier version of those chapters, uh, in which indeed they didn't know yet of any instance altar, just like Wellhausen after Popper suggested that the instance altar is a later addition to the prescriptive account in chapter 30. Uh, I accept this idea. And I think I suggested some rejects, rejections for those who attempt to resolve this issue in, in different manners. So that's what I have to say about this joke into those chapters. Yeah. At least in this question of the instance altar, in this issue, I think that it is correct to say that it preserves an eerie version that did, know, did, did not know it yet. Will you talk a little bit about what the Masoretic text is? Yeah, so, the Mas- so we have several, uh, in here we call it witnesses, for textual witnesses, for the biblical text in general. Uh, and we know that they ex- coexisted in antiquity. We know it now from the Qumran library. They were like... It was found there uh, scrolls that represent different variants, textual variants, and they're from the same library. For the same text, we have different var- variants. And now the major variants, or as I said, the textual witnesses that continued in, in history to, to function in religious and how you say it, I forgot the word now, in liturgy of later communities that use the Hebrew Bible as their texts, as their holy text, holy canon, the Jews, the Christians, and the Samaritans. And the Christians use this, actually, the the Greek translation, okay, which is known as the Spjugint, which is... Actually, a, a Jewish translation to Greek in Alexandria in the 3rd to 1st century BCE. But it was easier for Christians who did not speak Hebrew, but spoke Greek to use it. So they embraced this version. Uh, and the Samaritans have their own distinct version of the Pentateuch. Actually, they did not accept the entire Hebrew Bible, but only the Pentateuch. And they have some, the Samaritan Pentateuch has several characteristics, which is in general, we might say that this is a a more harmonious text because there are several times that there are contradictions in the text and or things that are told out of place. Uh, in retrospective, so the Samaritan Pentateuch tries to amend it by by placing it in its correct place and telling it not in retrospective, but in like where it should have been happened, should have happened. And the Masoretic text is like what most of modern translations use. The Masoretic text is actually what the Jews used uh, and uh, sanctified and used in their liturgy and it is called Masoretic because there was later, much later there was like an attempt to uh, to preserve the text to its letters 
very precisely and very accurately. And it is, Masora is actually something that you pass on in Hebrew, to limso, to pass on for someone. So from generation to generation, then this movement of, of trying to preserve the text to its very little details, actually they created a huge database of uh, every time that a word is written in a special manner, in a special spelling or something like this. So they like, they pointed it out and made a little note it at the margins of the scrolls of the books saying this is uh, this kind of this type of spelling appears only three times in the entire Hebrew Bible or something like this. Those notes are called Masora, something to pass on from generation to gen- generation. And then the entire version is called Masoretic text. Because it's just got a bunch of those little marginal notes. Yeah, because this is the base text on which those marginal notes were written. They were not okay. written on the other uh, versions, like the Septuagint or the Samaritan Pentateuch. And so between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, indications that the person who translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek is not aware of this later edition of the incense altar. So he he is because he mentions the incense altar in chapter 30 in the prescriptive account and chapter 40, which is, as I said, a different phenomenon. However, in those chapters, uh, 35 to 39, he probably received a text that did not know this edition yet. Yeah, an earlier text. Yeah. That, that's what he claimed. That the question of composition and um, how it came to be is very complex, uh, complicated. And in those specific chapters, yeah, it might represent an early version. So you have those two texts that you've evaluated. And since you brought in the Samaritan Pentateuch, where do we see incense altar, no incense altar mentioned in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Yeah. Yeah. So in the Samaritan Pentateuch, it is mentioned, the incense altar is mentioned, but it is in a different place. Okay. It is in what we, in a, a, you might say more fitting place. It is just right after, um, the text moves on to describe. Okay, then a different, ex- uh, a little exposition. The text, the prescriptive account of the tabernacle in chapters 25 to 29 is proceeding from the in- innermost um, space of the tabernacle to the courtyard, to the courtyard which is outside. And it begins with the vessels and then describes the inner vessels and then the inner structure. And then it goes out to the outer vessel, which is the altar, the offer, the burnt offerings altar and the cart, the how to construct it and what material it should, uh, it should be made of. And so we might expect the incense altar, which is an inner vessel the incense altar, which is an inner vessel, in inner vessel, to be um, described or prescribed in chapter twenty-five with the other inner vessels, the ark, the cover, the table, and the menorah. Uh, but it appears only in chapter thirty. So, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, it does not appear in chapter twenty-five, but it does appear in chapter twenty-six, right before describing the, the outer altar, the bronze altar, which is in the cart. So we might say this is an attempt to put it in a more logical place. Although it is not yet not uh, perfect. If it would have been a perfect insertion, that it would have been placed in chapter 25. But it also attests to the idea that it might be a later insertion and that's why it is inserted in a different place. 
Okay. There is a tendency, which we know from generally in the Hebrew Bible and also in later canonical texts like the Talmud and so on, that paragraphs, that secondary paragraphs are, can be placed in different places because like you just receive this parchment with the text on it and you decide where to put it. Two different scribes that uh, copy, the, copy the text can put it in different locations. That's what happened here too. That's certainly different than a world where we have books, where if I get a text, like the books behind me, they're bound and they just are the way that they are. And for me to, I think the idea for modern thinkers is if for me to modify these books behind me is essentially to destroy them. That doesn't work that way with scrolls. Indeed. But it's not only that. It's also that you have authority that tells you uh, when they want to add section 9A, then 9D uh, to the legislation book, then they add it in 9D. They add after 9A, 9B, and 9C. And when you open a book, you open a book that some uh, that has been processed in a very specific manner of editorial process, okay? Because you buy it because there is a, the authority of the author, which published the book in a specific publishing house. People publishing house, you say? Yeah. I'm not sure about the term. Yeah. yeah, so in a specific yeah. publishing house. But in antiquity, there were scrolls and there were scribes and there were schools and there were... And yeah, there is like an authority who tells you, you should add this section about the incense altar. But then you get the, the text itself and nobody told you where to put it and why to put it and how to put it. And different schools and different scribes used it differently so they added it where when wherever they've they found it acceptable and what i understand that this isn't may not be your specialty so it's fine if you say i don't feel like going into that what determined if someone had that authority i don't know uh yeah <laughs> like you said i, I told you you were allowed to not answer yeah, I cannot answer it in a definite tone. But it is a different authority, different... It's not a publishing house. It's schools and scribes and many individuals that work behind the scene and they might have different ideas and different practices. So at one point... This is a quote from your article. You say that Wellhausen correlates the absence of the altar in the text with the absence of the incense ritual. So why do you think he made that mistake? Generally speaking, Wellhausen tried to uh, to identify each stage that he each stage stage that he identified in the text. He tried to equate it with an actual stage in ritual practice and the reality behind the text. This is, he calls his book a prologomenon zu Geschichte Israel, to the history of Israel. So zu Geschichte Israel, to the history of Israel. He actually takes the legislation and tries to reconstruct on its base uh, the, um, on the stratification of the legis legislation, he tries to, to reconstruct, according to it, the actual history of Israel, of biblical Israel, and try to say, like, when we see legislation which is more, uh, um, how do I say it, which is more like social, then it is a less religious stage in Israel development. And then when we arrive at the priestly source, which is much more uh, theological and uh, um, uh, concentrated in the priests and the deity 
uh, and less in the individuals. So it represents a stage of uh, hierocracy, hierocratic uh, political reality. Okay, so actually, anytime this was his tendency, anytime that he found a stratification in the text, he tried to correlate it with an actual reality behind it. So he says, if it, the incense altar is a later addition, then incense was not practiced. It is also quite common sense. If, if you don't have any mention of incense, except for very sporadic uses of incense, then you might say that incense was not used. It, it is actually very logical. My claim is that analyzing Leviticus chapter 16, you might say that incense was a daily ingredient in the cult. But I can understand why it is not it is not self-evident and not obvious, and especially for someone with this tendency to correlate literary stages with reality uh, development. I, I think there's a certain amount of maybe ignorance of what life was like in the ancient Near East, though, if you don't know that having food out in your home requires you to have incense burning to keep incense away or insects away, it, you might not think that it's a necessary thing. So you just assume they don't have this. Is that fair to say? Also, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, and it must be said that Velhausen is strictly works with the texts and he is, he is reconstructing the realia on the texts. And yeah, it, he, he doesn't like look for uh, works of literature from the ancient Near East in general and so on. So yeah, the, the clues for uh, using incense in domestic places is very meager in the biblical text. Uh, there are some attestations, but I can understand why it would, uh, you know, um, someone would miss it. So, and when was he doing his work? The end of the nineteenth century, eighteen uh, seventies, and so on. So even with texts, he a lot of the a lot of the texts that there are. You mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls. Qumran was uh, no one of the. 20th he did century. Yeah, yeah, he didn't know that. Yeah. He, yeah, it sounds like he did a pretty good job with a lot of disadvantages. He did, right? a, he did a great job, yeah. I, you still read his work and you say, well, he was a genius. <laughs> and was he the one who originated the documentary hypothesis? No, but he he fashioned it in the manner that it is discussed since. So he actually took it and put it in a certain order, the stratification of the documents. Yes. So prior to Wellhausen, th there is like a long process of identifying the documents and the question of how many doc. The question was how many documents there are in the Pentateuch, and it began from two documents, Wistic and Elohistic, and then they found out that the Elohistic is quite, can be separated to two distinct documents in itself, uh, and then the Vet identified the Deuteronomic source and its relationship with the Deuteronomistic history, and then there was the question of how they became to be. Is Actually, the question was, what is the relationship between the priestly source and the tronomic source? And it has been perceived originally that the tronomist is the youngest, the latest source. And the uh, Graf and Wellhausen, uh, did, it was actually perceived that the, the priestly source is the base layer of the entire Pentateuch because... It is. It go. It begins at the beginning and at the end, and every other source is actually filling gap, filling gaps inside it. It has been 
perceived as the base layer. And then Graf and Velhausen actually took it all upside down and said it is the latest source, the priestly source, the priestly document. And this is why, and actually Velhausen made it a very persuasive argument, gave many, and gave all the implications of this reconstruction regarding the entire Hebrew Bible, not only the Pentateuch. Uh, so he is regarded as the father of the documentary hypo hypothesis, but is actually he's building on the work of uh, former scholars. So he's more uh, like a stepfather. No, he's one one of the ancestors. Like Jacob is not the the first uh, patriarch. Patriarch. Yeah? <laughs> he's, yeah. He's, patriarch. Yeah, he's the third one, but he's still a patriarch. Man, I didn't. I I'd never heard. Obviously, I'm not in that world. I'd never heard that the priestly source is the the most recent. Is that I mean, so? Is that still a perspective that's out there? The, there there is a question. There is a big question about the documents at all. Okay, Deuteronomy is quite fixed. Yeah, this is a distinct document, you might call. And but the J and D are like very objected, mainly in Europe, but not only, if there were any such compositions. So the question of the priestly document actually depends on this question of how you perceive all the other texts in the Pentateuch. When you say that things that are claimed by Conrad Schmid and, uh, and other German scholars, that uh, they were like patriarchal narrative and exodus narrative that were later, only later combined, then, uh, and the, the priestly is actually the, very first one to combine them, then you might say this is the actually very first, very first document in the Pentateuch and the, all the other uh, texts, even if they're earlier than the priestly source, they are not sources, they are more like traditions and so on, uh, excerpts that were uh, transmitted to us. Uh, but uh, it is quite common to think of the priestly sources, a second temple period product. Also, again, this is, there are people who oppose this view, mainly in Israeli scholarship, Haran and my teacher, Baruch Schwartz and Viktor Hurwitz. They gave like very good cases to claim that the priestly source is earlier to Ezekiel, which is in the exile. So it might be pre-exilic document or at least pre-exilic, again, traditions that were transmitted to us in the Pentateuch. But this is a very, yeah, I think that you have opinions in the number of scholars that deal with it. It's one of those, you, you ask 10 scholars, you're going to get 11 opinions kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I know it's getting pretty late over there on your side of the globe, yeah. <laughs> so I won't keep you that much longer. That's okay. Just final thoughts. In your conclusion, you say that this analysis, your analysis, must also affect our perception of the meaning of the ritual system. You talk about how we can, you can no longer say with confidence that all of the divine senses are satisfied with the, the sacrifice. Do you have more to say on that here, wrapping up? I thought I have, and I wrote something about it in my MA thesis, but I'm not so certain about it uh, now, after three years, five years, sorry. So I keep it as an open question for the audience <laughs> so, and the readers. That's fair. I like open questions. That's why I have this podcast. Is there yeah. anyone's work that you think people should be reading in the broad wow. area of biblical studies. Oh, okay. So I thought you're asking about the priestly literature. So priestly literature, if you want a good basis for understanding it and its theology and ideology. So Israel Knoll's 
the temple, uh, the sanctuary of silence is must read book. This is not that I agree with anything that he says, but he, he is a great scholar and writing like you, you can read it. Like it's not like a novel <laughs> He's very readable and it gives okay. a great sense of what happens there in the priestly literature. Uh, I might even say that anything that he writes and is translated to English is must read because he is writing in a very interesting and attracting manner. And you just want to agree with anything he says, even if you disagree. So yeah, this is my recommendation for the listeners. Thank you. And I know now that you're <laughs> wrapping up your doctoral work, moving on to postdoctoral stuff, I'm going to keep my eye on you. I'll be bothering you <laughs> to come on here as I read more <laughs> of your work to, to talk. So if, unless you have anything else, I think we'll call this one good. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you very much. And I'm really honored that you uh, contact, contacted me about this article. The pleasure is mine. Hannah El Shapira, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe and rate the podcast on your favorite platform. If you are interested in following supporting or engaging with the podcast anywhere else check out the link tree that i've hyperlinked in the show notes i try to put episodes out as soon as possible for five dollars a month on patreon so if there's something that i've announced or you've seen on social media just know five dollars a month you can listen to every episode that i have edited and i try to get them up within a week of recording the conversation take care